Hello everyone, welcome to um, the state of the art review session uh, number four. Uh, I'm Chata Turkay from University of Warwick. I'll be the moderator for this session. So this session is, is called Trust and Provenance. So we have two very impressive surveys that are that we are going to listen uh, and discuss. So I'll give you a bit of uh, like housekeeping first. Um, so what we will do is that after the introduction, we are going to listen to a pre-recorded video of the first talk, and then we we'll go to a question and answer session. While you're listening to talk and, and also during the Q&A session, you can post your questions on the YouTube channel, or you can post your questions on the Discord channel that we that you can access through the the program. So if you haven't uh, installed on the Discord software yet, uh, make sure that you you do it um, on the site. And what we will do after the question, we go on to the second talk, and then the sec after we listen to the second talk uh, again, there will be a question and answer session. And I'll be I'll take your questions and and present them to the the. Uh, to the presenters, so make sure that you are clear as possible. So I sort of state everything as 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 you want it. So let's move on to the talks today. So we have very interesting uh, surveys. The first one is about the trust and and the, and the machine, like the the machine learning uh, process and how visualization has a role in that. And then the second one is on the um, visualization provenance and then the research uh, opportunities and research literature around that. So we're looking forward to hearing those talks. Uh, there will be 20 minutes talks followed by 25 minutes of discussion. So we have lots of time for discussion. So uh, whenever you think of a question, just type it in, in, the, in the channels. So we're now going to the, the first talk. The first talk is it's called The State of the Art in Enhancing Trust in Machine Learning Models with the Use of Visualizations. Uh, the authors are Angelos Chatsimparas, Rafael Martins, Ilari Yusufi, Konstantin Kusher, Fabrice Rossi, and Andreas Karen. And it will be presented by Ang Angelos, who is from Linus University, Sweden. So now is the time for the talk, and see you in the q &A session. Hello, everyone. My name is Angelos Katsibarbas. I'm a PhD student at Linus University, Sweden and I'm here to present to you our paper entitled The State of the Art in Enhancing Trust in Machine Learning Models with the Use of Visualizations. This work is a collaboration with my colleagues Rafael Martins, Ilir Yusufi, Kostidin Kutzer and Andreas Keren from Linnaeus University and Fabrice Rossi from PSL University in France. Here we have the agenda of this presentation. I'm going to start with a brief introduction and motivation about how we came up with this survey. Next, I will talk about the background and related surveys we found. Then we have the methodology we followed and initial statistics with regard to the papers we analyzed. Afterwards, I will present the core categorization of trust against facets of interactive machine learning that we created. Then the presentation of a few data-driven analyses, which we have performed based on the metadata we collected. And finally, I will finish with a conclusion of a couple of research opportunities we identified. The idea of the state-of-the-art report began with previously gathered data. In January 2020, our survey of surveys on the use of visualization for interpreting machine learning models was accepted for publication. From the meta-analysis that we performed for that report, we identified many open challenges for the visualization community, such as the visualization of online training processes, mostly for neural networks, enhancing trust in general, mixed guidance, and others. If we take a closer look, enhancing trust in machine learning is one of the most commonly cited challenges, but it was never explicitly addressed by any other survey. This became our motivation for this paper. With regard to the related surveys, we split relevant work into four main pillars. Interpretable and interactive machine learning includes for instance, the work by Liu and others from 2017, which contains categories such as understanding, diagnosis, and refinement. 
Several other works tackle the related issues of accuracy, quality, errors, stress levels or uncertainty, but trust in machine learning models was not addressed before. When we started the exploration of this subject, a fundamental question was, what is trust in general? Although it is not easily defined in prior literature, there are several definitions of trust in the context of computer science, such as the example of Zhuang and others who define trust as the actual and perceived accuracy of an analyst's inferences. As another example, Li and Xi gave a generic definition of trust, which is the attitude that an agent will help achieve an individual's goals in a situation characterized by uncertainty and vulnerability. We based our paper on this definition and further expanded it into a more detailed multi-level model according to the multi-nature of trust. We also distributed an online questionnaire to gather information on the overall question. How would visualization help enhancing trust in machine learning models? We allowed also providing answers on open questions such as which process steps of the machine learning models and or properties of the data might be assisted by visualization for increasing the trust in those machine learning models? The most popular answers were everything, in other words, all together, and then followed by data importance and feature importance. From all these answers, we were able to inform and update our multiple levels of trust. This is the overview of the different trust levels we conceived. In red, we see a typical machine learning pipeline, with the raw data being connected to the first trust level. The second trust level is linked to data labeling and feature engineering, and the third is linked to learning methods or the so-called algorithms. Trust level 4 is connected to the concrete models, which are instantiations of an algorithm with specific parameters. Finally, the evaluation, together with the user expectations, is related to the fifth trust level. Visualization, shown in between in purple, can be useful to control the entire process. The glyphs represent the various types of users such as beginners, domain experts, model developers and machine learning experts. The outcome of this process is the generated knowledge, shown in a yellow cloud at the top, together with real-world applications. The arrows are bidirectional as humans and computers work together in an iterative way. In green there are the individual categories that we generated for every trust level and at the same time each phase of the pipeline. We followed the methodology guidelines from various related works and we expanded them. We started with a search for definitions from relevant work in different disciplines, shown in purple. At this stage, we also conducted an online survey which informed the design of our trust levels and categories. In blue, we have the process followed for the collection of the 200 papers analyzed in this star. Our first step was a pilot phase where we gathered work closely related to the subject and extracted pairs of keywords relevant to trust and machine learning. Those keywords were used in combinations of two while searching in well-known visualization and machine learning journals, conferences and workshops. We classified the papers we collected by dividing them into approved, uncertain or removed if not relevant, as shown in green. A specific protocol of communication was used to avoid any misalignment with the colleagues. In orange we saw the different data analysis we performed at the metadata level, with distribution analysis and generated authorship networks and after the categorization for individual papers related to topics, correlations, temporal stats and others. In this histogram we can see the number of techniques we found and categorized for the various years from 2008 to 2020. For 2007 we did not search extensively, but we found one technique from the related work section of another paper. Obviously, 2020 was also not searched entirely since we stopped in January. The trend seems to strongly increase during the years of 2018 and 2019, and the perspective for 2020 looks very positive toward techniques that work with problems related to trust in machine learning. With regard to the venues, IEEE TVCG, CGF and IEEE VAST were the main journals and conferences where we identified the most papers. However, in general we found various submissions in multiple venues, even from other disciplines mostly related to machine learning such as workshops in ICML and KDD conferences. We used network visualization to present the relationships between co-authors. 
The largest cluster is number one, with multiple collaborating people. In this cluster, Huang Min Kyu, Remco Chang, Daniel Kaim, Kagatai Turkey, and Nan Chao seem to be the most prominent authors with many connections. Cluster two is the industry related, which is quite disconnected from the rest. Fernanda Vegas, Martin Wattenberg, and Steven Drucker are the most eye catching names. The categorization has eight main aspects concerning the data, machine learning, machine learning processing phase, treatment method, visualization, evaluation, and target group. The figure on the left shows the categorization used in our survey. The total number of corresponding visualization techniques per category is shown in every row, along with heat map style icons. Please take a look into our star report to see the connections between the five distinct trust levels with 24 categories and facets of interactive machine learning that we described before. Moreover, to facilitate the exploration of this categorization, we host an online survey browser at trustmlvis.lnu.se. You can explore the papers on the main view with the help of interactive filters on the left sidebar. As an example, we have taken a data entry from our online survey browser. It is an interactive visualization tool called Clusterophily 2 which was built for guided clustering analysis. What-if hypotheses are supported by this tool, which guides users in a clustering-based exploratory analysis. It also adapts incoming user feedback to improve user recommendations and helps with the interpretation of different clusters. This extensive data-driven analysis confirmed our manual categorization that we have just shown. In detail, for our first analysis, we used topic modeling with latent Dirichlet allocation to extract the top eight key terms from the full text of the papers and then assign them into 10 different topics. From those key terms, we then manually labeled the topics. Three out of 10 topics are about neural networks and two topics concern projections and dimensionality reduction. For instance, topics one and 10 include visual analytics tools focusing on the visualization of the neural network's hidden states and neuros activations, and the comparison of models based on the visualization of their parameter spaces. Topic three instead focuses more on diagnosing the training process for reinforcement learning. And topic four reflects the comparison of data structures with the use of projections and dimensionality reduction. Another example is topic seven, related to finding the correct distance function and checking if these distances are preserved after the projection from the high dimensional space into the two dimensional space. View A is a TSNE projection of the 200 papers according to their topic assignments. The tightest cluster, for instance, is color encoded in green and related to neural networks, models, hyperparameters, and visualization of reward during training for image applications. Most clusters are well separated, showing a clear distinction in the topic assignment of the papers but there is some overlap between topics 6, 1, and 9, for example. This happens because topic 6 is about machine learning models explanations, which is rather generic, and it includes topics concerning deep learning and projections as is topic 1 and topic 9. Another interesting insight is the mixing of orange and pink points, as well as of pink and red points in the impending. This happens due to three concept terms that are spread in all three topics, namely the terms clustering, dimension, and projections. As we can see from view B, topic 6, about machine learning models, explanations, and visualization systems evaluation, and 7, with regard to subspaces exploration and distances examination in clustering and dimensionality reduction, are the most prominent ones, followed by topics 5, 9, 8, 10, and the others. With regard to view C, some interesting top terms are, as expected, models, image data related to computer vision, layers for deep learning, clusters, topic analysis, subspace, projections, and dimensions for dimensionality reduction. From the final results of our categorization, we extracted the most popular and the most underrepresented approaches, based on the number of papers in each category. The vast majority of the papers address supervised learning and specifically classification problems. And in second position, dimensionality reduction and clustering which belong to unsupervised learning. 
A few popular visualizations are bar charts and more traditional visual representations such as tables, lists and matrices. They are usually paired with other simple instance-based exploration techniques. Color is the visual channel most commonly used for encoding information. There are other large number of techniques using opacity to hide points and size to encode data characteristics can be explained by the extensive usage of scatter plots. Around half of the visualization techniques that we analyzed have not been evaluated. For the second rust level, researchers focus on the comparison of structures. In the third level, understanding is quite popular. This category can be considered under the umbrella of interpretable machine learning methods. For trust level 4, performance is a very often occurring category connected with the selection process of an individual machine learning model. In trust level 5, metrics validation and results observation at the final stage of the processing phase is the most frequent category. Last but not least, for the target group aspect, the visualization systems and techniques have as a main target group usually practitioners, followed by machine learning experts with large distance. Let's move now on the underrepresented approaches, which could be further researched. For machine learning methods, approaches such as stacking ensemble learning, deep convolutional networks and deep Q networks are not covered in detail. For machine learning types, the subcategory of solving classification problems while using reinforcement learning is almost never visualized and actually never addressed explicitly by the visualization community. Another category that is underrepresented is reinforcement learning for control. The real challenges start when we check the trust levels because many techniques are underrepresented, which means there are several research opportunities in the area. Transparent collection processes, source reliability, and data bias are usually not covered by papers. Other problems such as uh, how visualization can assist with the familiarity a user has for a learning method should also be in the research agenda of our community. Knowledgeability about learning methods and details available to different types of users is not well supported. As a result, customization and reconfiguration of visualizations that take into account the experience of users in order to choose a specific machine learning model are not researched to the required extent. Also, user bias is ignored in almost all of the visual systems. Finally, developers and beginners are the two most underrepresented target groups in the papers we analyzed. We have also conducted a correlation analysis for the categories used in our survey using Pearson's R coefficient values in order to reveal specific patterns and intriguing cases of positive in green and negative in red correlation between categories. The full correlation matrix is shown in figure A and can be found in the supplementary material. We also list the most interesting cases in decreasing order of their correlation strengths. For instance, model agnostic techniques contradict model-specific techniques because they consider different visualization granularities for a given machine learning model. 2D and 3D oppose each other as typically only one of them exists in a visualization approach. When source reliability is taken into account and researched by scientists, then the transparent collection process is usually examined together. When model bias challenges are addressed by visualization, then model variance is another category that is addressed simultaneously. This statement can be supported by the well-known bias variance trade-off, for example. Techniques that focus on data exploration, explanation and manipulation related to the in-processing phases of a machine learning pipeline are very different compared to systems that monitor the results in the post-processing phase of a machine learning model. With regard to domains, recurrent neural networks are commonly used for humanities and dimensionality reduction for biology problems. This is the information about each category's count of corresponding techniques over time. The values are normalized by the total count of techniques for each respective year between 2007 and 2020. Comparison of structures and outlier detection are the first subjects covered by research, and then guidance and recommendations steadily increased over time. In situ comparison of structures inside the models and what if hypotheses are newer trends than the visualization of performance, which was much more common in the early years. Understanding, then refinement, debugging, and finally comparison seem to be the order with which visualization focused on exploring. Nonetheless, all of them appear a lot of times more than the other categories. 
evaluation of the visualization is more common nowadays than it was in the previous years. Afterwards, we found the most frequently occurring datasets used in individual research papers. In total, we managed to identify 144 non-synthetic datasets in our 200 surveyed papers. The most frequently occurred datasets are NIST, IRIS, Wine Quality, ImageNet, Food and Nutrition, CIFAR 10, and 20 news groups. Three out of these da seven datasets are about computer vision and are usually used in papers that work with neural networks. Now we are going to talk about the research opportunities we identified from all those previous analyses. By looking at our categorization, we can infer that some level of bias might be represented in all our defined trust levels in different forms. Data bias, previous familiarity with algorithms, model bias and user bias. Hence, a possible future research question is what novel solutions can help users to minimize the impact of bias with regard to the data. Visualization is often used as a medium for enabling human-computer interactions. Here we foresee an open research challenge upon how to combine visualizations, verbalization, in other words, text explanations, and voice commands that should together perform overlapping tasks in complex visualization systems and propose task solutions to the users. When research is conducted in machine learning, there is a factor that is not often taken into account at first. How do we secure machine learning models from unethical attacks? Nowadays, visualization systems are deployed online for users to access them easily. Such internet accessibility leads to further problems concerning security vulnerabilities. Regarding fairness, we identified a few potential research questions for future work. How fair were all those decisions and how can fairness be translated between the trust levels? Another challenge is the development of further guidelines and best practices for how people within different scientific fields and varying backgrounds and experiences should communicate and which visualization techniques and systems should be established as a standardized interaction medium between them. Finally, all our underrepresented categories can be considered as open challenges. Some of them were briefly mentioned before in this talk. Feel free to read more in our paper. That was it from my side. Thank you all for your attention and remember to visit our web-based browser at trustmelvis.lnu.se. Thank you very much, Angelos, for this really interesting uh, work, really rigorous and, and novel study. Angelos, I think you might need to unmute yourself. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. All right. Uh, so first of all, I've extend the uh, uploads that are coming from the YouTube channel uh, and, and sort of vi virtually passing those over to you. Thank you. And now, just want to highlight again that we have a good 20 minutes also for discussion. So I encourage everyone to sort of uh, type your questions on the YouTube channel, on the Discord channel. So I'll get them over to, to uh, Angelos and colleagues. So we also have, uh, as you can see, more authors in, in the background uh, in the same room and also we have Fabrice Rossi who is also on the call and who might sort of respond to some of the questions. So while we wait, while I wait for some questions to come on the YouTube uh, channel or the Discord channel, I'll, I'll start Angelos. So first of all, I think you, you, you changed the way that at how these surveys could be done. I think one very unique aspect of aspect of your work is that you use computational tools very effectively in the survey. So in, in addition to more qualitative ways that we always use, uh, I think you make very good use of, of techniques like topic modeling, graph network analysis and clustering, all of those interesting uh, techniques that you that you apply. Can you sort of Explain this a little bit why you maybe went into that direction and, and, and sort of I have a bit more specific question after that then. Have you seen your 
categorization and then some of the categorization coming from the computation tools complementing each other or conflicting each other and how was that process can you tell us a little bit more yeah first of all thank you very much for the question uh, actually um, the idea is that we wanted to combine uh, both qualitative and quantitative data so we started early with uh, uh, when we were defining the trust levels and all this stuff, we started with uh, an online questionnaire. Uh, so we wanted to, to inform exactly the categorization that we came up uh, after that. And also um, then after we have uh, manually uh, assigned all these categories and we analyzed all these papers, uh, we had uh, extra levels uh, with data analysis. So uh, we wanted more or less to combine a manual together with, as you said, together with uh, uh, automatic approaches uh, like using LDA and uh, performing topic analysis, correlation analysis. And the good thing is that uh, actually uh, the, the one complements the other. So in many cases we found that uh, our manually assigned uh, uh, label, uh, our manually assigned class, uh, classes more or less for these papers uh, were then supported by the, um, the automatic computations. Um, so, for example, uh, as we know, interpretability and all this stuff, uh, explainability, uh, they, we have topics that uh, say exactly this thing, that we investigate the behavior of models. So this is more or less connected to what we have, what we came up, uh, it's connected to what the topic analysis uh, uh, automatically came up. And this topic analysis happened with, um, uh, with uh, only analyzing the, the full text of the paper. So it's very data driven. So it's not something that we did more or less uh, on our own manually. Uh, yeah, I think uh, that that uh, that answers your question. Or yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe there is this uh, like role for the techniques that we we see in in visual analytics, where we have this uh, semi-automated, user-driven approaches. I mean, maybe in the I think one p potential direction that your your method is showing is that you can start with the topic modeling results as a as a maybe as a first step and then you can manually refine it using maybe a visual analytics approach and then that could be the basis of your taxonomy right yeah exactly and uh, actually because uh, we have done uh, another also a survey surveys and then after that the survey uh, we, we think that uh, we could also even publish uh, even uh, some like a paper for for this thing. So mm -hmm. how you, do you start uh, with qualitative data? Then you do some manual uh, research, and then you move to quantitative data or the other way. And mm -hmm. this is another possibility maybe for the community. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly true. Great, thank you. So Kai is asking on the uh, Discord channel. <clears throat> question about your interactions with the um, machine learning community and then the machine learning papers so he's asking and, and i think you've done the, um, the i mean one thing that you've done was that survey so he's asking did you talk to people from the machine learning community and i see that fabrice is, is, is on the call and turned his video on so he's from the machine learning community so maybe uh, you can tell us a little bit the, the interaction between the two communities, the visualization machine learning community and how you've reached out and how the machine learning community sees trust in general. Uh, yes. Um, can you hear me? I think uh, for you, Fabrice. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. I think uh, you should be on. Yeah, the, um, there have been a, a long uh, reluctance in the uh, long-standing reluctance in the machine learning community to uh, uh, let's say let the uh, machine learner interact with their models uh, in the fear of creating overfitting or similar problems uh, but with the uh, um, uh, increased interest in, uh, in, in uh, trust in uh, machine learning models especially concerning fairness, for instance, but also explainability and similar uh, topics. Uh, there is a, um, a growing understanding in the machine learning community that uh, uh, enabling users or machine learners to interact with their models uh, might be the only solution to uh, resolve uh, contradiction between fairness uh, metrics, for instance, or to uh, explain uh, the outcome, uh, the way a decision is reached 
in a, in a machine learning model. The, the uh, naive, uh, let's say, uh, approach uh, that consists in, for instance, extracting a decision tree from a complex uh, machine learning uh, technique, or let's say uh, deep learning uh, models, for instance, uh, this naive approach uh, is naive. It cannot uh, lead to uh, actual explainability of, uh, of models. And so in order for to, to, to give some uh, convinced, uh, conviction to the public about the, the way a decision was made, for instance, uh, the may, probably the only way to do that is to allow uh, users to play with the model, for instance, to understand uh, uh, around their dis personal description what other decisions could have been done by playing with the variables and, and things like that. And, and so there is a, a more and more understanding that uh, this aspect uh, can, will need to be uh, addressed by um, interactive visualization. And it's already the case, in fact. And so there are uh, the, 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 the links between the community that, uh, is, is uh, growing around this type of, uh, of uh, problems and issues. Thank you. Thank you for this. And I think it's this the recent workshops in, in visualization and having like in Eurovis, there's MLVis, and, and at ICML, there's a visualization sort of uh, workshop. And I think th the communities are responding to that challenge at the moment. Thank you. I mean, but one, one question I had maybe in relation to that, I was sort of quite interested with, with that, uh, that survey that you've done in the beginning, the online questionnaire that you send around. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more who, who, who were the respondents? I mean, did you reach out to uh, like data scientists or researchers or practitioners? And, and what, what sort of, what did you, I mean, you kind of, over it a little bit, Angelos, but maybe you can detail a little bit of the, the questionnaire. Yeah, uh, are you talking, for me, right? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, the idea of the questionnaire was actually to, to distribute it to online to people that are actually um, very related to machine learning to see what they think about visualization and if it is necessary to use visualization in the several area, in the several stages of the pipeline, let's say of the Massilian pipeline. So uh, actually we, we received around 27 responses uh, to that. And most of them were from people uh, uh, with subfields of, uh, that belong to subfields of computer science and even machine learning. And, and we saw a, a very high interest in, uh, in using visualizations in, in the different parts of, um, of the machine learning pipeline. So uh, for example, uh, they wanted to use visualization uh, when they were uh, processing, pre-processing the data at stages, uh, for example, uh, related to uh, the source reliability. So if a source is reliable or, or even if a model is uh, performing uh, as, they, as it should perform. Uh, so uh, more or less in pre-processing, uh, in processing and post-processing phases of the pipeline. So it's very interesting uh, that uh, they, uh, they seem to, to need uh, visualization. Uh, to, to trust, uh, more or less, what the machine learning uh, is doing. Thank you. I mean, there's a, there's a comment from Michael on the YouTube channel that it's his, his, his experience and feeling that, that machine learning researchers think that this has done already what it can, and, and maybe the, the, the this community is not innovative for them. So what, what would you say, Fabrice? Uh, um, unfortunately, I think uh, some of the members of the uh, machine learning community are exactly in this kind of uh, line of thought, and that's a uh, that's a shame. And uh, the way uh, poor visualization techniques, even static ones, are used in uh, in some machine learning papers is uh, is uh, proof, so to speak, of uh, this uh, form of ignorance of the uh, of the field uh, of the information visualization field in, in general. Uh, the, 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 you will see pie charts, you will see, uh, I don't know, there are poor uh, choice of colors and, uh, and similar thing that, that leads to a fairly uh, usable uh, graphical representations. And the, and the worst uh, is that sometimes as a reviewer, I, uh, uh, in a machine learning paper, I uh, ask for the, for the uh, researchers to uh, at least do a, a minimal <laughs> check of, of their visualization. And, and suddenly they discover that there is a whole field of research 
of high quality uh, about perception, about uh, what is efficient, what is not. So there is a link. Uh, 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 there is still some uh, work to do in order to bind more the, the two communities, even if this has been done a lot by uh, uh, by some of us. Uh, and I, I, I'm. I'm not saying that because most of the attendance is from the information visualization community, but I think that the uh, information visualization community has been more open to machine learning than the reverse. And um, and things, I think things are slowly changing because of this uh, fairness, for instance, and uh, explainability and everything that is related to trust. And that's why it was uh, yeah. really uh, nice for me to be included in this group uh, mm -hmm. producing the... Uh, Solve it. Yeah, I think look, look looks like but the with the emphasis moving also to the human side of how these machine learning uh, methods are being used, how people are interpreting those, and how people are interacting with these models. I think there's a, a bigger a bigger role of understanding of visualization can help with the communication between yeah. the machine learning models and people. Great, thank you. Um, I'm sort of watching the channels for other questions. I hope there will be some, but I, I'll, I'll um, maybe again to uh, to you, Angelos, uh, and maybe to, to anyone else who wants to respond. I mean, I had this sort of uh, question that I had about this relationship between the uncertainty and trust, and then you mentioned that in your like very initial definition of, of trust. I mean, one thing that's still I'm sort of not decided, do we trust things that are more um, sort of transparent about their uncertainties or, or that are not very transparent about or hiding things from us? Like I was thinking of the recent, uh, like, the, like, like how the politicians are sort of responding to the pandemic, right? In some parts of the world, it's every, all the details are, are maybe open but then you you are exposed to the uncertainties in the models, uncertainties in the in the data much more than some other response uh, where, where uh, the uncertainties are not really communicated and everything is hidden. So I was sort of like intrigued by this relation between uncertainty and trust. Do you think revealing uncertainty uh, so it diminishes trust or 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 leads to more trust in these systems from your from your observations in this literature yeah thank you for the question um so in our um, trust levels that we have defined uh, we we take into account the uncertainty uncertainty awareness uh, which is actually in one of the very first um, uh, trust levels which is the second one uh, so i think it's uh, actually uncertainty is actually one part of trust because trust is not only related to the data, uh, it's not only related to machine learning, it's, it's, not only, it's more or less related to every of these stages. Uh, so it's, uh, it's connected to the data, machine learning, uh, the evaluation, the user expectations at the end. So I think they are connected somehow, but not, uh, so if we don't have uncertainty in, uh, in the data, then this doesn't mean that uh, everything else will go very well. So the, in the other stages. So it's a, it's, a, it's a thing that more or less uh, accumulates as you as you start from the data, you you add more uncertainty, for example, uh, you miss something, and then when, when you're at the stage of the results, you you don't have to do uh, you, you can have good results and trustworthy results because from the beginning your hypothesis might be wrong. So it's important to take into account all these stages. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, interestingly, I had a question about that. Like the, like your your trust levels. Is there um, some sort of hierarchical relationship in terms of importance? How important they are, or do you see them more as as different facets where, which sort of relate to each other in very strongly? Uh, yeah, I think uh, they are very uh, they they are very much. Uh, related because uh, as I said if, we don't, if you don't have trustworthy data from the beginning then what is the point of using different machine learning models so so in the end the result will be untrustworthy uh, so I think it's important to start with uh, the basis so the, the first stages and then move on uh, and not only concentrate for example our community only concentrates in, in explainability for example of machine learning models this is not only the problem usually we have other problems like the, the features the data the sources of the data 
how the collection was done and, and other stuff. Uh, and this is why uh, we came up more or less with the survey. This, this was the point. Mm -hmm. Really good, thank you. Uh, a, a really interesting question uh, from Elio Bentocilla on the on the YouTube channel. Uh, and the question is, is that did you find yourself maybe not fully trusting the results from the applied machine learning techniques that you used in the survey yourself? Uh, and and like like I, th I think the, the like the question refers to these these topic modeling and then the clustering techniques that you've done. So if if there was some distrust in the in the results from the computation analysis, can you give an example and how you resolved that distrust in the computation results? Uh, thank you for the question. Very interesting. Uh, to be honest, I think we we didn't um, have ex an example to give uh, related to that, but. Um, we mentioned in a couple of lines in the paper that uh, maybe the results that we're getting from the TSNE, for example, uh, that w was used for the topic analysis, maybe it's not 100% accurate. But the good thing is that we had, uh, on top of that, we had colors and, uh, and we had more or less some uh, labels, let's say, some, uh, you can say, ground truth. So we try to see what happens. Uh, and it seems that uh, the, the projection is quite good. But of course, uh, there is a problem. Always, there is a problem of, of trusting these uh, uh, applied machine learning techniques and uh, the, the automatic algorithms. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, a, that's a very interesting question, right? Uh, good. Um, just looking at the uh, the channels. Maybe maybe one sort of like. One maybe final uh, question that I can pose is 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 about the um, the like the user levels and then the, the like different types of users and knowledgeability and then towards the end you mentioned like familiar the knowledgeability as as areas that are not uh, very much studied and in your in your sort of uh, model you have these different different users with different levels of knowledge. Um, uh, can you tell us a little bit about like what are sort of different, um, like how they have the knowledge of these, like expertise of these users uh, have an impact on which mo which techniques are, are better used? Like like if a, if a user is, is not very knowledgeable, um, do they sort of ignore like lots of the uh, problems in the like in the models in the modeling results? If, like if they're an expert, they have a different relationship with the models. So what what types of relationships have you seen between the techniques and the different types of users? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I think this uh, this goes towards the um, the correlation metrics that we had. So in this metrics, you can see different connections between the categories. Uh, and we actually found uh, some interesting findings, like, for example, the beginners, uh, they usually don't wa want to interact so much. They might want to mostly understand uh, and explain uh, some simple stuff. So to know the machine learning model, for example, and how it simply works without seeing the, the internal parts. Uh, then you have also uh, other categories, such as, as you said, the developers, for example, or the machine learning experts. So these people care more about um, uh, being able to steer the model or see or debug the model or, or do other stuff. So, um, stro so exactly, uh, trust more or less relates to the different users and uh, different stages, and uh, each one of them uh, wants to do something different, uh, as I said before. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much again, Angelos, for responding to all the questions in great detail and thank you and congratulations to all of you for the really good work and i've uh, also recommend everyone to check the online page uh, it's it's on discord i tried posting it on youtube uh, as well but i think youtube doesn't let links to be posted on the chat so make sure but it's also on the paper make sure that you uh, explore the the survey uh, through the online tool so thanks again. Thank you. Bye. Uh, so yes. So the next up, we have the second survey, 
uh, and the second survey is is called it's it's on the analysis of user interactions and visualization provenance. Uh, it's by Kai Shu, Alvita Otley, Connie Waldschofer, Mark Streit, Remko Chang, and John Vanskovich. So, so the presentation is given by multiple authors. And yeah, we can go to the pre-recorded talk now. Welcome to our talk. This presentation will cover our survey on research related to the provenance analysis in visualization. The survey is a joint effort by many authors and the presentation will also be covered by a few authors. What is provenance? The Oxford Dictionary defines provenance as a place of origin or earliest known history of something. This is often used in the context of a valued object or work of art, such as a famous painting. For a painting, its provenance includes information such as who the author is, when and where it was painted, and the history of ownership changes. In the concept of provenance is adopted and extended in computer science and applied to notions such as data, computation, and user interactions. For example, the provenance of data or data provenance includes the context information such as how, when, why data are collected, recorded, stored, and processed. It provides a broader context than how it was originally used not only the information to repeat the process, but also context such as why it was done. Why do we need this survey? Provenance is a fast-growing area in the visualization research. Recently, there are many new works that relate to theories on visualization and interaction provenance, provenance capture and visualization, and provenance analysis. Such analysis can be used to understand users, for example, for evaluating visual analytic tools and support user sense making tasks, such as providing personalization and helping collaboration. Actually, there is so much new work that in this survey we can only focus on the last part, which is an analysis of provenance. In this survey, we focus on the analysis of user interactions and provenance data in the field of visualization, whose main purpose is similar to the meta-analysis as defined by Reagan. As such, we only include existing work that incorporates meta-analysis based on user-generated interaction provenance data with a high-level goal of improving, enhancing, or understanding a visual analysis system, visualization process, a visual artifact. We define only recorded information of an interactive visual analysis session without any further analysis out of scope. Also sophisticated machine learning or active learning approaches based on binary decisions are not within our scope because they do not take the meta-analysis into account. We also do not include user studies that collect user-generated data and work on collaborative sense-making if there is no additional analysis of the provenance information beyond recording and sharing. We started by collecting existing work that we know from our previous research. We continued with a systematic approach by manually screening all issues from four journals and all proceedings from five conferences or symposia over the last 11 years, starting in 2009 and ending in 2019. For a systematic approach for our paper collection, we continued with a three-stage process for the tagging. We first started with an explorative tagging with literature we were aware of. Each contributor of this contribution was assigned to at least one conference or journal to screen. The used tags were manually assigned to get an overview of relevant literature. This process resulted in a collection of 266 papers. The aim of the second round of coding was to unify the categories and narrow down the scope. 
And that is why the second stage is called categorical tagging. To achieve this, we developed a close set of keywords for the spectrum of possible reasons for doing meta-analysis on provenance data, as well as for the state of the art of user interaction analysis. Each paper was coded by at least two co-authors independently. All co-authors were in constant exchange to resolve cases for an ambiguous and uncertain classification. In the last stage, supplementary tagging, we decided to further split up the two main categories, the why and how, into subcategories. Therefore, we divided the collection into six subcategories for the why aspect and five subcategories for the how. In the course of the analysis, we came to the conclusion that exclusively tagging the how section for provenance analytics is not sufficient. To address this issue, we introduced an additional what aspect that allowed us to characterize the different encodings of provenance data in more detail. After going through all three phases, we ended up with 105 papers. We collected all papers and displayed them in a static table in our paper. The categories are highlighted in the respective color for why to analyze provenance data in green, what types of provenance data and ways to encode it in brown, and how to analyze provenance data in blue. Finding an appropriate structure for the table was difficult. We decided, therefore, to let users explore the list of publications interactively. We implemented a website where users first get an overview of the categories and then can decide whether the why, the how, or the what has a higher priority in search. Structure of our survey is based on a high-level provenance analysis model that we created to describe the important factors and their internal relationships in provenance analytics. Analysis goals are the reasons provenance analysis and give rise to requirements such as what data capture and how the data is encoded. In our case, we call it the what. Encoded provenance data is then further evaluated by analysis techniques. How, such as classification models or probabilistic models. At the end of the process, users gain either user-specific or system-specific knowledge that can be used to improve or adapt to any of the process model components to enhance the overall provenance analysis iteratively. There are many reasons why researchers and practitioners analyze provenance data. We highlight six common categories in the paper. We begin with understanding the user. Here, the goal is to create theoretical and computational models that describe the reasoning process. Examples include quantifying hover and click patterns, predicting personality traits, uncovering exploration bias, and modeling attention. Also common was the analysis of provenance data to understand the system itself or to evaluate its usefulness. These include papers on using mouse and eye data to learn the importance of visual elements, modeling task performance to guide system design, and visual analytic systems to evaluate interactive visualizations. Perhaps the most common goal that we observed was in the area of adaptive systems. The aim here is to improve the usability and performance of visualization tools, and topics ranged from recommended systems, providing guidance to the user, and adaptive prefetching. Another category that we observed was model steering, and here researchers use provenance data to improve the underlying data representations or the machine learning models. This category includes systems such as force fire that uses semantic interaction, and dysfunction that uses direct manipulation to adjust the projection calculations for high-dimensional data space. We found a series of work aimed at replication, verification, and reapplication. For instance, with VizTrails, an analyst can create, edit, and compare provenance data flows. Harvest recommends notes and relevant views based on previous analyses. Knowledge Pearls allows users to rank and retrieve previous visualization states. 
Finally, researchers have analyzed provenance data with the goal of report generation and storytelling. We found papers on producing automated annotations, data-driven reports, and summary insights. In this section, we will briefly discuss the types of provenance data and how to encode them. We divided the existing work into four types, sequence, grammar, model, and graph. Sequence is probably the easiest way to log activities. One of the most common activities is user interactions, which includes keyboard input and mouse movement. Logging of application state happens when the user's interactions are not semantically meaningful. For example, user interactions for web browser are simple, saying mouse click, but logging the pages that the user has visited, also known as clickstream data, results in much richer representation of a user's behaviors. There's an increasing interest in logging a user's mental state, often with the use of physiological sensing, for example, EEG. Instead of logging individual user interactions, such as button click, higher level semantics can be recorded to provide semantically richer provenance, for example, using the interaction taxonomy by Jing Songyi and others. Similar to logging application state, in visualization, a user's browsing behavior in a large 2D canvas can be recorded based on what part of the canvas they are viewing. This type of logging is often applied to map visualization. A user's interaction can be treated as a continuous stream of events. As such, temporal data analysis methods can be applied to find patterns. The second type is grammar, which encodes user interactions as logical rules. Each user's interaction results in a predicate, for example, x is greater than 10. These interactions are chained together using first-order logic. More complicated is the use of a domain-specific language or script, for example, in Drangular by Kendo and colleagues. The user's interactions for data cleaning are represented as scripts that resemble regular expressions. Another similar approach is to convert a user's interaction into a specification or template. The third type is model. For example, if a user's interaction results in the refinement of a machine learning model, the log can be the changes to the parameters of the machine learning model. In contrast, where the system wants to infer something about the user, for example, in a mixed initiative system, then the logging would be the gradual learning of a user model. The last type is graph. Provenance information is often used for sense making, and the user's knowledge can be represented as knowledge graph, entity graph, or concept graph. Another type of graph is an interaction history graph. This is related to logging raw user interactions, but with additional analysis to discover more structure. For example, a user performing an undo operation would result in a branch behavior in a graph. Next, we consider techniques for the analysis of provenance data. The categories that we present in our survey are not clear-cut. Indeed, there is a considerable amount of overlap between the various provenance analysis techniques we see here. The most common technique is the use of classification and statistical modeling to differentiate sequences of user actions. Here, we see a variety of classification techniques that include common strategies like clustering to permit users to interact with eye gaze patterns, as well as regression used to predict the user's skill acquisition when interacting with bar graphs. Common machine learning techniques like support vector machines have been used to process and classify eye gaze data. Further, topic modeling and other dimensionality reduction techniques have been used to identify relationships between users and movie recommendations, for example. More complex techniques have also been seen, like artificial neural networks used to predict important regions in an interface, as well as hierarchical techniques like decision trees. 
Other techniques that focus on patterns in the data can be divided into those that either automate the analysis of those patterns of provenance data, or permit users to explore and analyze such patterns manually. With respect to automated analysis, techniques such as adaptive contextualization can compute metrics based on a user's provenance data, while visualization-centric approaches to clustering and pattern matching on collections of websites enable the detection of branching patterns in event sequences. Similarly, notes and concepts that log past analyses can be retrieved using systems like Harvest. In the manual analysis context, sketches are a common technique for analyzing provenance data, allowing users to query, for example, trajectory information. In addition, rule-based systems permit users to generate rules, encoding events automatically in regular expression queries. Probabilistic models can be used to support the nuance and uncertainty inherent to interpreting and inferring from imprecise provenance data. Basic statistical techniques like the t-distribution and chi-squared distribution enable the clustering of groups of users. Bayesian classifiers, simple probabilistic classifiers that incorporate independence assumptions between features, can also be used to identify data items from large datasets that are of potential interest to users. Fuzzy classification results like those generated by convolutional neural networks predict tasks as next actions. Markov models are also commonly used to perform such actions as anticipating mouse interactions during exploratory data analysis. Additionally, natural language interfaces can be used to interpret the complex instructions provided by Program synthesis represents another method for provenance analysis, closely related to the grammar approach of encoding provenance data. For example, the use of domain-specific languages to encode provenance data, which later may be converted into regular expressions. More complex forms of encoding, like graphs, have also been used for the encoding and analysis of provenance data. Additionally, understanding the cognitive behavior and strategy of users via think-aloud studies and the review of interaction logs can enable the post-hoc analysis of provenance data for tasks such as analyzing eye movement data to identify user exploration strategies. Further, interaction can be used to analyze provenance data. The semantic interaction approach used for interaction with the projection of glyphs and the manipulation of constraints and coordinates demonstrate one means of interactive exploration to understand underlying models and learning routines. With respect to visual analytics in general, the Inside Insights system, among others, provide web-based interfaces for the analysis and exploration of provenance data. Additionally, knowledge graphs have been constructed for the purpose of collaborative analysis. Finally, the generation and analysis of visual design can be used to develop methodologies for participatory design processes and formative evaluation strategies, later used for the design of novel analytical tools. The last part will briefly discuss research opportunities in this area. There are still many unsolved problems related to user cases discussed earlier. For example, user intent modeling is an important challenge that is far from resolved and a fully automated solution is unlikely in the near future. Provenance can be beneficial to related fields such as machine learning. One example is explainable AI by capturing and visualizing the evolution of the internal structure and how the model responds to different inputs. User can have an improved understanding of model behavior. As for provenance encoding, Many of the existing methods do not fully consider the multi-layer nature of provenance, from the low-level system logs, such as mouse movement, to the reasoning-related provenance, such as insight and rationale. Besides increased complexity, it is difficult to capture provenance, such as user thinking. In most cases, this is still done manually, which is ineffective and time-consuming. In terms of provenance analysis, many of the existing works still rely on the relative simple techniques such as k-means clustering, and new techniques from fields like machine learning are likely to further improve performance. There are still many fundamental problems that await better solutions. One such example is provenance chunking which groups the steps in an interaction sequence based on analysis actions that they belong to. Chunking closely related to the multi-layer issue discussed in the what section and help connect provenance across layers. Most of the techniques and tools reviewed here have specially designed provenance format. However, real-world analysis often involves integrating provenance data from multiple tools, 
which is currently not possible unless there is a common standard. This will be a challenging task, but essential and beneficial to the entire field and the wider research community, encouraging new collaborations and enabling new research. Thank you very much, Kai and, and, and colleagues who have presented a really interesting, really rigorous work. Uh, I, I, I want to start by saying that this is really, uh, really an impressive work. And then you managed to look at the, the issue of provenance and visualization from all the possible angles. So, I, I mean, when I was reading through the paper, I was thinking, whatever I was, I could think of uh, about provenance was there and there were more, many more ideas of approaching that. So congratulations for doing a, such a great work. And, and I'll, I'll passing those uh, claps from the audience over to you, Kai, Mark okay. and, and Connie. So by the way, everyone, Kai uh, is the first author and then he's, he's is on the call, but we also have Connie and Mark on the call as well. So depending on the questions, they will show up on the uh, on the video. So while I start the questions as usual, go ahead and get your questions on the YouTube and Discord channels. And I'll start by asking uh, a very sort of a practical question. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a, you have an impressive uh, team on this on this paper. So how did you come together and how, and how did you work together? Was that a, a Dachstuhl meeting or, or something uh, that led to this project? Yes, yes, I think uh, and we had a Dachstuhl in 2018 and that was, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and specifically on the analysis of provenance data. And uh, I think uh, actually at that time, and Mark was not able to join because it was a bit late and a clash with his schedule. Um, but the idea of this survey is actually only, I think, came about sometime in 2019. Actually, um, Remco, who cannot be here, and he's definitely an expert in this field, he thinks there's a need to do some survey because there's so much work recently. And, uh, and actually, everyone all agreed, and we are quite enthusiastic in writing and uh, yeah, and then when it started, it took us quite some time to put everything together. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, while we wait for questions from the audience uh, on the on the channel, like my first question is is on on that point. I think Alvita makes that point that the one of the most dominant areas that you've seen is is on this adaptivity, right? Uh, it, which I think it was also there was the recent workshops at this last year that was sort of in that topic. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about this this adaptivity and personalization and the the, so the potential for um, maybe a, a wider application of of provenance for improving uh, uh, visual analytics systems. So is this going to be an area that is going to that that you assume that there will be more research in, and will that be a, a, a sort of a big role for prominence going forward? Um, yeah, and okay, I will start, and then maybe Mark and Konian want to add in a bit more. And so, in terms of adaptivity, I think, uh, and it's in the sense, so the system tries to understand. <laughs> For example, the personality, the experience level, some other traits of the user, and then try to provide a more personalized or tailored response. So I think it's definitely related to personalization, and it also depends on the type of analysis user are trying to do. So if you can understand better what type of user analysis user is trying to do, you might be able to um, adapt and the interface to that. And the other possibility is, and you can say, try to guess or predict whether it's an experienced user or it's a very beginner, and then the system can adapt accordingly. And that usually will be helpful for the system. 
So and so in terms of provenance, so provenance is essentially providing the kind of the input data for this kind of analysis. So this is what you can capture from the system from and user interaction, from user annotation, or the type of data the user looked at or opened, or even the type of analysis you or type of validation you applied to the uh, data. And then then comes the more challenging part is how do you predict? And again, so that, that itself will kind of become a machine learning problem. I think uh, there's lots of potential there. I think quite the probably the more successful example now is the type, semantic interaction type of approach. And essentially, they're trying to understanding the higher level of user analysis instead of say just click and uh, and open the file and then try to respond accordingly in a way that's helpful for the analysis. And uh, so my personal thing is, sort of is, once we were able to understand a bit more and um, or the higher level user thinking more effectively, and we will be able to do more in this field. But currently, mm -hmm. it's still quite difficult, for example, try to understand or guess exactly what type of analysis user is trying to do, or even say what is experienced or no, novice user that's still not very accurate mm -hmm. and uh, the the other issue is relevant is and in this kind of recommendation or personalization you have to be very careful so if you make a few like a wrong recommendations you might lose user trust quite quickly and so in the survey we use this like a kind of bit old but the clipping from microsoft office example early on and i think it's definitely the right intention but then you can if you're not be very careful then you can get and lose you the trust very quickly yeah 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 um, maybe i can add to that so so trust is an issue um and that relates to the previous star obviously uh, but my feeling with this is that uh, that with these adaptive systems there is much more to come uh, we have we have uh, mentioned great work in the star but this is mostly in very early research phase if you look at tools um, like tableau or other off-the-shelf tools um they're uh, those those tools they don't use it yet and there are good reasons because it's a it's a tricky problem right um but i expect there is much more to come also in the direction of, of guidance where we have done some work um where you need to know something about the user as well most of the systems do that based on the data that you have and maybe a little bit on the tasks, but there it gets tricky already. But when it comes then to knowing uh, knowing the user, there it gets uh, it gets really challenging. So I think there is much more to come. That's my personal view, at least. Mm -hmm. I think one one very interesting point that you also mentioned during the presentations, and maybe that's sort of another area that we will see more and more, is like understanding the mental state of the users, expertise of the users. Uh, <coughs> And one one question related to that, have you? I mean, most of the the work so far is is maybe uh, like looking at log interactions, uh, like like the mouse and click and mouse interactions. There's a bit of eye tracking related stuff that you've shown that you mentioned during the talk. So how you how how do you see like multimodality coming into play? So different modes of interactions. So there, there's 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 more and more like people are using maybe text like Tableau wrote that uh, ask me feature now where you can sort of type in some text questions or or you can do gestures so you could track people uh, uh, like with the camera I mean I think in the in the in the picture that you have on the slide there was the like the uh, uh, the cap uh, the neurological uh, tracker so the how do you see the multimodality, multimodal interaction, uh, and the relationship of provenance? Should I start, Kai? So yeah, yes, I think yes, that's, yeah. that's a really promising direction. Uh, what we do in, in in terms of research, like as a community, is to like to poke in a discrete manner into different directions, right? Um, uh, to to explore the the opportunities, for instance, to to capture or interpret EEG signals or to, um, as you've mentioned, the different modalities. Um, but the the thing that we are not good at is the fusion part. 
thing. So if you also look into other communities that are this sensor driven research things, so not this, there the fusion part adds a lot. But this is something which which is difficult to approach as a research community, right? Because uh, you usually uh, you, you have one device and you want to explore that. But what would make it really successful, I guess, um, for actual use would be this fusion part, right? Interpreting gestures, interpreting voice, interpreting, um, and then you can you can benefit from the different strengths and the different aspects of those. Um, but this is hard to approach as a research community, I guess, with small teams. That's um, yeah, maybe that's also where we, we like it's similar to the previous talk where we need cross uh, like cross workshops between maybe the machine learning community that looks into fusion uh, or HCI the wider HCI community and, and the visualization community. Yeah, and what I wanted to add is that if so, we expect that and we mentioned that in the future uh, work part that our community will use also more sophisticated machine learning models um, to, to interpret the data. Um, but this is not unique to uh, when you compare it to other communities, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I think what is unique to learn something about what's special about visualization interaction provenance, right? And, and this is the challenges we as, as these researchers can, can solve because there are also many other challenges attached to it um, mm -hmm. that are not core of these problems. Yeah. Uh, you would like to add anything? Yes, maybe just add a little bit. I think this is definitely a very promising direction. And I think one of the challenges in current provenance analysis and is actually we don't not have enough like input data in general. Mm -hmm. So all we have is quite limited. So any additional channels or modalities will provide more input and to the problem. Essentially and this will help, as I say, we have more data, we'll make the inference more accurate or more effective. And uh, again, as Mark said, and the challenge is actually how to fuse these, make actually actually improve performance rather than say do the other way around. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's all. Yeah, and there, there are no good test data sets available, right, um, that we can use. We have test data sets for other problems, um, but not so much for interaction provenance from real tools, right? Um, um, I assume that 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 vendors uh, like Tableau, Microsoft Power BI, they have such data, but it's not publicly available um, because it's like a treasure <laughs> they want to hold on. Um, but this also makes it when when we looked at interaction provenance, we, we we gave it to our industrial partners and we tracked what they did. But it's still a relatively small data set, and then mm -hmm. uh, some machine learning approaches they don't uh, they don't pursue, produce meaningful or, or high quality results. So that's uh, that's another roadblock, I would call it. Mm -hmm. And I think part of also uh, that that challenge is is how how that data is formatted and and sort of then shared, right? And I think uh, some clues are in in these different representations that you share, like these graph based representations or these task and taxonomy based representations of how this data could be, in a way, stored and shared. Maybe we need those repositories that that map to like known task taxonomies or known uh, sort of knowledge taxonomies that could be shared and maybe adapted and studied in different contexts. Mm -hmm. So that's that's also like I mean, there, there are so many so many interesting directions to go. Mm. And I just want to add to that. I completely agree. And also, and um, I think uh, one of the points we mentioned is actually. We might want to have a more community-based effort, actually, to have some common standard for storing and exchanging problems data. And so it just—it's very practical. It just says, and many of the tools have their own unique formats. It's not in, like, exchangeable easily, and which will be a, like, a obstacle when we try to say collecting or creating a common benchmark data set that everyone can use. I think for that we need to like agree on a kind of provenance state format, but itself can be quite challenging, just as have come up any other common data standard. Mm -hmm. but there is, and say W3C has some more format which has a more abstract level, and but maybe that will be kind of start point. We can have a more specialized version for this community and interaction. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
There's a question from Christian, Christian Tominski on the Discord channel. And it somehow, in some ways, relates to our discussion about data and, and availability of data. So he's asking, what if expert visual analytic tools are used by only very few experts, which is often the case uh, in, in our sort of research prototypes? Can we still learn from very few users? And he's also asking, from your experience, how large a user base do we need to, to, to sort of meaningfully extract knowledge from them? Yeah, I, I read Christian's question a couple of minutes ago and I, I took the time to think about it. Um, but it's, it's a really good question and, and uh, it, it bothered us as well. Um, I think it's, it's not, uh, so it, it's two aspects. It's the number of users, the number of different users you need to generate data, right? But it could also be that you have lots of sessions from the same small user base. Um, but in any case, I think you need a critical number of sessions irrespective of whether it's uh, from, from a large user base, um, only a few sessions or many sessions from, from a small user base. Um, and then uh, I, I don't have a good answer to like, what's the number? This is the, so uh, it's, it's um, but we, we have, we had dealt with that in our projects as well. And it always uh, gets tricky when you try to infer stuff from small world data. data. Um, so this is, yeah, I don't have a good answer. Maybe Kai and <laughs> Connie can can, um, can say something about it. Um, I don't think I have an answer, but maybe I can add to the discussion. And I think this is one of the fairly unique challenges for provenance analysis. And it's not possible to like create something like an image in it. And um, you just say, and partly because, um, how do I say? And the problem itself is quite diverse. It's not very simple to say I want to find the dog from the picture and just depends on different type of analysis, what people do. The inter at the analysis section are very, very different. Mm -hmm. And in terms of data set, I think we probably need both, say a collection of multiple users, but also we might need just say, sometimes we just need the provenance from a single user. For example, in terms of, say, semantic in interaction or personalization, you really just want the data from a single person. You don't want the data from other people to make recommendations for this particular person. And yeah. this kind of gives it a unique challenge for any um, provenance analysis. It says you have to take into account that you're not going to have, say, millions of data points. You only have hundreds and maybe dozens of sessions, and that's, you have to make your best out of those. Maybe make it a bit more challenging, but maybe you're unique and interesting that way. Yeah, yeah I think in, in in some ways that's sort of uh, that we already experienced that. Like that when you work with a small focus group, you go quite in depth with what you can learn from that small data, like or versus a crowd like crowdsourced study where you have lots of data, but you can ask certain types of questions and you cannot go too deep in the tasks that you test them with. So I think you learn like very different uh, things from from all of these. So yes, yes, and sometimes it's like a can kind of like a balance act. You have to say you no, know, okay, given the amount of data I have, the certain things I probably will not be able to do. I just try to do the best with the one I have. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah um, I think this this relates to Michael's uh, comment. Michael Bierish, um he said that. Um, or it was more a comment that someone should think about developing a language that is able to to generate some data, and I, I think that's that's um, that's that's a good idea. Um, we tried we tried that uh, like in a small world example. We we, we we took for instance our own Gapminder implementation and and we worked together with Kai also on a on a project where where we look into um, like projecting interaction provenance data and making sense of that. And there we also um, try to generate artificial sessions, artificial stories. But then um, it, it comes to what, what Michael said, you need to pose some constraints, like uh, a user would never do that, then uh, you need to exclude that. Um, uh, and you need to, to, to add some rules to the generation of such data sets. But I think it's, it's actually a, a good idea that, that could that could uh, that could bring us a bit forward. Mm -hmm. 
yeah and I mean, some of the some of the challenges that that you have is I think it's, it's in between the line that like these interactions are quite messy uh, and then like one other challenge that you that you that you mentioned Kai in the talk is the, the problem of chunking what's the meaningful interaction what are these different pathways that people take and I think there's always this difference between what you imagine as a designer how people would behave and how they actually actually behave. And then they deviate from these models, which makes it, of course, hard to fit in these these boxes. Yeah, really, really interesting problems. I mean, one question, one discussion also, uh, I wanted to sort of bring up uh, is is on reproducibility. And I think one very important role for provenance is, is the reproducibility of um, visual, visualization studies. And I, you've done that work, Mark earlier of, of like creating a provenance of an analysis session and replaying that and putting sort of indicators etc uh, how how do you see this as a as a as a vehicle for maybe an, an open science movement for visualization research like or any any project that use interactive visualization for the reasoning process so like like we share data and statistical models that the scientific papers. Do you see that like a, a provenance might have a role in 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 sort of advancing the open science agenda and maybe we share some provenance records together with our papers where we use visualization for reasoning? Uh, yes, I, I completely agree that this is super important. So I we covered that in multiple projects and I, I think we can we can do much more um, as as a community to make our research uh, research more reproducible um, but I see many many different um, different research groups do that they, they um, as you know the discussion also in the committees uh, they, they try to encourage people to submit their data they try to encourage people to submit their code and so on um, but then it's also about um, making the the results from exploratory data analysis reproducible. This is where it gets tricky because this is not like a script that you run. Um, it's, it's more like a story that evolved that is very nuanced with dead ends and so on. Um, so th this is, um, but I think this, this, that's, a, that's a really important building block um, uh, for the future. And, and this is of course also related to, to, to this provenance aspect, but we, we, we didn't cover that a lot in this, State of the art report because we we had a long discussion about the scope of this work. Kai and Connie and and uh, all the others can can confirm that. And then we try to focus on this meta analysis aspect. So as you know, the the work by by uh, Reagan and colleagues was was broader, covering all aspects of provenance. And we try to be more specific on this meta analysis aspect because already there it was an overwhelming amount of papers to screen <laughs> and go through. Yeah. Yeah, and um, just add a little bit to that. So we did include reproducible signs and as one of the kind of possible application areas for provenance in the survey. But as Ma uh, Mark mentioned, just due to the scope, we didn't go to into too much and um, into details in that area. And uh, actually, personally, I think say just if you want to reproduce the process itself, it's kind of less difficult. It's more say other people can look at the process and still understand a little bit later. So as Mark said, you can record the analysis process, but the second person when they look at it, they might not understand why these things are done, what user was trying to do. That's the part becomes a bit more difficult. If you just record everything and replay, that's technically easier. Yeah. Yeah, I think then it maybe brings those other challenges about what what to what to record, what not to record, and what are some meaningful uh, chunks to sort of record, right? Okay, I think I'm sort of looking one last time to the different channels. If someone has a burning question, you can just say, wait, but if not, <laughs> um, I would like to sort of thank you all for sort of joining this this call and thank you very much Kai, Mark and Connie for your contributions uh, to this channel and thank thanks to all the authors on this on this session
but it's really a um, rigorous, really useful and important work. And thanks to all of you who ask questions on the YouTube channel and then uh, sort of uh, like at, at more content to our discussions. And now it's it's lunch time or coffee time or dinner time for, for all of us. Thank you and have a nice day. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you.